You can be seated if you can. Uh, uh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Uh, it's always a blessing we get a chance to come together and do something for God in a unified spirit. This is not just going to church. This is the coming together of believers where Jesus wants to meet us. And most people underestimate it because we've made church just religion and an experience. But if we would believe the word of God, he said, wherever two or three come together in my name, I show up and I meet them there. So thank you, Jesus, for being in the room. We are a true church, which means we are. We are transparent, real, and unedited. Don't want to be any other way. Everything else is weak, all right? We have been in this build series. Has this series been blessing anybody? I want to... All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. We are still in it, and we've got a ways to go. Um, what up to my, my our E-Church uh, online family, E-Nation? What up? What's y'all... How y'all living? Love, 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 peace and soul, all right? Uh, glad to have you all. Every time I travel, I run into somebody on E Nation. It always blesses my heart, all right? So we're still in this build series today. Today we're teaching from this subject, two sides to the story. Two sides to the story. It is imperative as we're in this build series. One of the things that we're doing is we're building who we are building our own mind, building our own discernment, building vantage points and perspectives. We're learning to grow. And as we're learning to grow, one of the things that you need to do is divorce that your way is the only truth. This is a hard thing to do for many believers because we're passionate people. And since we're passionate people, we locked jaw like a pit bull onto an idea and nobody can take us off of it even if the idea is wrong I don't know if you ever watched Waterboy but Waterboy had believed that his mom was telling him the truth uh, whatever mama told him he said my mama wouldn't lie to me mama told me the truth and and they were in class and he said why does alligator have all the teeth he said well mama said alligators have all their teeth because they they they, they, they don't got no toothbrush and they honor it, you know and and uh, he, he's really lost looking at him as he's talking and the professor says to him something that broke his heart he said mama's wrong again and he said, Mama's never wrong. <laughs> You're wrong, Colonel Sanders. He was, he was angry. He was angry. The professor was calling out his belief system. And, and I'm just saying this. I don't want to fight you this morning, but I want you to listen, that maybe some of the stuff you've always believed wasn't 100% true. You know, it's hard to grow up and realize that some of the stuff you believe were never true. The, the, to have those coming to Jesus moments where you soar up and down that that person was the best person in your life and then you grow up and find out that that person had a history too. You know, I was shocked that my grandmama wasn't always saved. My, I, I said, no, my, my, my grandmama loved Jesus. She, she said, oh no, back in the day, baby, I used to walk the street. I said, wait, wait, no, grandma. Grandma, don't tell me that. I thought you loved Jesus at three. You start to learn that there's two sides of the story. And to grow in understanding and discernment, you have to be willing to challenge your own perspective. Perspective, by definition, is the capacity to view things in their true relations or relative importance. In another word, you can say being able to see things for what they truly are. There was an author by the name of Michael Paterniti. He said this, in the end, it wasn't so much that there was an alternative narrative. There always was, but it came down to belief. Which one did you want to believe? Which one or which version of the story suited you best? Or perhaps more to the point, which one told the story you were already telling yourself? And this is so profound because he says oftentimes we are listening to stories just to see if what we hear is going to confirm what we already believed. 
And then anytime somebody gives you something that is contradictory to what you believe, you immediately shut it down, but not for the sake of it being false, but for the sake of it challenging what you've already believed. This is a real challenge, and we find this within Scripture. We're still in Nehemiah 6, verse 17. It says, during those 52 days, many letters went back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. Now, for 52 days, letters are going back and forth. The entire time that Nehemiah was building, he was also fighting. The entire time that he was building, he was also fighting. There was never a time where he was allowed to rest. Never a time. And I need you to know that just because you decide to take a day off, that does not mean the enemy will take a day off. You have to remain prayerful. I know you get fatigued, and that's exactly what the enemy is banking on. He's banking on you saying, you know what, I'm just tired. Today ain't the day. And that's the day he comes knocking on your front door. The one day you decided that you weren't going to put your armor on. The one day you decided that you were going to stop praying. The one day you decided you were going to stop following God. That's the day he comes to attack. Read the Bible. It was the one day David decided not to fight, that he fell into the worst mistake of of his life the enemy knows that you at some point you get fatigued and he's banking on you taking a day off but this is important to pay attention that your progress will always be fought whenever you are trying to build your progress will always be fought all 52 days Nehemiah was fighting and if you're trying to build something, your progress is going to be fought. If you are trying to build a new life, maybe you're coming out of the lifestyle you used to live, and now you want to live for Jesus, and you want to do it right, your progress is going to be fought. It's going to be fought through struggles, fought through people, fought through attacks. It's like all I want to do is have a different lifestyle, and here I am having to war every day, all because I'm not living the way I used to live, but... Progress has to be fought. Maybe you are stepping into ministry and stepping into ministry, progress is going to be fought. Please know the enemy is not going to sit idly by while you snatch people out of his kingdom and just let you have fun and have your little ministry and have your little prayer line and have your little women's group. Please don't think that the enemy is going to let that happen and say, go ahead, have your way. No, he is going to fight you tooth and nail every single step of the way. Maybe you're just trying to build a godly relationship and you're trying to do it God's way. The enemy is like, no, I don't want you honoring God in your relationship. I will fight it tooth and nail. The moment you want to put God in, I make the attacks heavier. This is a very real process, and this is why we have to stay focused. I learned in my life that my biggest fights came when I needed to break the most. My biggest fights came when I needed to break the most. The enemy was very strategic. He didn't fight me at my strongest. He ain't going to fight you after a 21-day fast. That's a bad idea. That's not the time. You, you may think, oh, yeah, he showed up and fight me. I'm telling you, this is a distraction. He's going to wait until maybe a month or two after the fast, and you don't kind of kick your shoes off, relax your feet. That's when he shows up, when you are least expecting it. It's called a blind side, trying to catch you on your day off. We see this happening in Nehemiah, that he's fighting him over and over and over, trying to catch him at a weak spot. And here in verse 18 is where it gets critical. It says, for many in Judah have sworn allegiance to him, talking about Tobiah, because his father-in-law was Shechaniah, son of Era. And his son, Jehoanan, was married to the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. Now, when I'm reading this, you saying, past all I heard was a bunch of names that are difficult to pronounce. And, and, and that's why you have a pastor, because it's my job to do the research and bring you the information. Let's go. Let's go, right? So here we are. Let's get the backstory on Tobiah right now. Uh, some of y'all would say, what's the T? So the T on... Uh, uh, on Tobiah is that he used to be just a servant boy. So Tobiah was not a person who was born into money. He was a servant boy who had to work his way to the top. 
This means that he was highly influential with a lot of people because he was not born into money. And you know that kind of story. A lot of us love the TV shows where somebody started from the bottom and had to work their way to the top. We love the song, started from the bottom, now we here. We, we love that, right, that I came from nothing, that nobody gave me no handout. I had to go fight my way. Tobiah had to fight his way, and then he got a little bit smarter. Uh, he went and married an Israelite daughter. Uh, and his son married one of the daughters of the main builders of the wall named Meshulam. Now, Meshulam worked with Nehemiah to build the wall. As a matter of fact, two of the main sections were built by Meshulam. And Tobiah said, okay, how do I get relationship? So his son went and married Meshulam's daughter. So even though he was their enemy, he was connected to them by marriage. They, he had relationship with them because their kids loved one another. This is, we had, you got to be careful who you love. You, they, they, their kids love one another. And Tobiah understood that this was very important, that if you want to have a different kind of attack, it has to come through covenant. Please stick with me. This is why the family of who you marry matters. All right. I'm going to see if you caught up with me. The family of who you marry matters because they can bring problems to your home that have nothing to do with you. Now Nehemiah is here fighting, not because he did something bad, but because his people decided to marry some broken families. And, and marrying into the wrong family will have you fighting demons that did not come from your bloodline and that did not come from your ancestral lineage. Lineage, You can be fighting against stuff that had nothing to do with you. I, I want to just give you this word that many of you may not even know this, but some of the stuff that you've been fighting did not come from your family. Some some of the stuff you've been fighting has come from the family of the person you decided to love. Some of the stuff you're fighting in your kids did not come from your bloodline. Some of the stuff you're fighting in your kids came from the ancestral lineage of the partner you slept with. And when we don't understand the value of this, we keep thinking it's just about arousal and sex and intimacy. But no, some stuff is the enemy trying to get a covenant with you by who you lay with. And because you keep thinking it's all fun and games, and you don't understand why am I going through all of this now I slept with one person and now I'm having dreams where I can't breathe and I can't move and it's stuff fighting against my home it's who you have a covenant with their daughter married an enemy he married an enemy and now there's war there's war and Nehemiah can't necessarily pick out who's doing what because they married somebody from the other territory they had sworn now this is big here because of this family relationship Tobiah started to intermingle with the Israelites I'm one of y'all. We're together. We're family. And these people has sworn an allegiance to Tobiah because of his family connection. Sworn an allegiance to Tobiah because of his family connection. You know this, that when you're with somebody, you swear to their family. You swear an allegiance. They, sometimes they'll make you want to put down your family for theirs if you're not careful. Uh, and so they swore this connection to Tobiah. Uh, and these were people who at one point in time were on Nehemiah's side. They, they were on his side, but now they have pledged their allegiance to Tobiah, the man who's trying to destroy him. Now stick with me. So this means that Nehemiah's fight came from people who was his partners. Now, now this, this may not... Uh, sound like a lot, but I need you to follow along what's happening. Nehemiah's on the wall. He got partners with him. He's telling Tobiah, I, I cannot come down. I'm doing a great work. And, and I'm pretty sure his partners are right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay up there, Nehemiah. He's doing a great work. And Nehemiah doesn't know that people that's helping him has a partnership with the person trying to kill him. Okay. Um... I need you to know the spiritual law that when the enemy cannot get you from the outside, he tries to use someone from the inside. 
It's an inside job. He tries to use somebody from the inside because he knows that you closed off. You don't let a lot of people in. You know, you, you, you stick to your circle. You said my foe and no more. You've been very, very tight. And, and, and now it, what's happening is sometimes the enemy will try to use what's closest to you. If you think I'm tripping when he knew he could not get to Adam, he said, what's the one person Adam would been to? Let me go to Eve because I know he loved her and I know I I can't get his attention, so I'm going to go to the person that he loves. Ain't it crazy that the craziest fights in your life usually come from people you love and people that you brought close to you and people that you would have never imagined a sword coming from? Proverbs 18 and 24 backs it up by saying there are friends who destroy one another. But a real friend sticks closer than their brother. Real friends stick close, but fake friends will destroy you. If you don't know this, please hear me this morning that you can have people in your corner and they're the ones holding you back. The very people that you have sworn an allegiance to and made your ace is the one stopping your progress. It's Nehemiah's friends, they're his partners. They built the wall with him, and now they have sworn their allegiance to his enemy. In verse 19, we find it here. It says, they kept telling me, Nehemiah's saying this, they kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds. And then they told him everything I said, and Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. Now, stick with me. You know, Tobiah's sending me these threatening letters to intimidate me. Me and him are going back and forth, and the whole time me and him are going back and forth, this dude is doing me wrong. But while he's doing me wrong, all these people keep telling me about how good Tobiah is. He's a good man. He does good things. They, he, we've seen him serve in the community. We've seen him work. So to many people, Tobiah was a good man. But to Nehemiah, Tobiah was a demonic force. To many people, Tobiah was a good man, but to Nehemiah, Tobiah was a demonic force. Now, before you say amen, I may have to make you think for a minute. I ask you this question, can two contradicting things be true? Can two, contradicts, can, can, can two things that are the opposite be true? They, they, they complete opposite ends of the spectrum, but both people are having a real experience. Proverbs would explain it this way in 18 and 17. It says, the first to speak in court sounds right until the cross-examination begins. Um, uh, what, what, what it sounds as if is that if you ever see in court is the person who's giving the first argument sounds extremely convincing based on the facts that they have presented to the jury or the judge. But when the cross-examination comes, it, it seems as if they also have facts that are contradictory to the facts that the first argument had. Now, can both of these be True. I want to help walk you through an understanding both mentally and spiritually. In psychology, this is known as dialectics, all right? Our mental health can be heavily determined by how we accept the dialectics that confront us. Dialectics are two opposing things being true at once. What that means is otherwise is known as true contradictions. I'll make it plain because it's hard for you to say amen, all right? Um, you can be an amazing human in one person's story while being the trauma in somebody else's. <laughs> I'm going to preach it. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, some people know you as amazing. You've done some great things. Ooh, you so good to the people. But then there are some people, if they were to ask about you, you aren't that amazing. As a matter of fact, you would be the bad person in their story. You would be the villain in their story. You would be the one that they're asking God to help me forgive this person for what they did to me. And here's the reality that both of these can be true. That, that both of these can be true, that you could have given your best and still it wasn't good enough. Not knocking you that both things can be true. Romans 7 and 21 explains it this way. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Please stick with me that just because you had good intentions, it doesn't mean they had a good experience. I want to help you mature this morning. I want to help you mature. Well, can't nobody tell me I didn't mean good. I didn't say you didn't mean good. What I said is that to them it didn't feel good. 
that the world is filled with good intentions, but even while intending to be good, you still can cause some harm. Many people don't plan to have a car crash, but still irresponsible driving and texting has made them damage somebody else. And so though you may be a good person, you still have caused some real damage. These two things can both be true. I'm trying to help you mature because you married a belief system about yourself and it's stopping your growth. What you trying to say about me? I'm not saying you all bad. I'm, I'm saying you a child of God. I'm saying you love God for real, but while loving God for real, you still can be missing some of the things that God wants you to grow in. I'm not trying to put you out. I'm trying to bring you in that maybe God wants to grow you in a way you haven't grown before. I had to learn in my life that some of the same people who hurt me helped somebody else. <laughs> and some of the same people that hurt you have been a really good help to somebody else. I know it's hard for you to give God glory for this because you've made this narrative in your mind that the person you're hurt with and angry with is all bad. But how is that possible when you aren't all good? <laughs> I'm here now, okay. How is it possible that they are all bad when you are not all good? Mark 10 and 18, even Jesus explains this. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus asked. He said, only God is truly good. What does that mean? That means that if you are living in this flesh, you also have a propensity to do something wrong sometimes. And so though you may be good to a lot of people, please know you have also been the villain in somebody's story. You have been the rude person. You have been the one that cut somebody off. You have been the one with an attitude problem. You have been the one that hurt somebody. You also have been the one who's been bad in their story. And while you're sitting right here struggling to forgive somebody, please know that somebody's struggling to forgive you. Woo! They having a hard time watching you in church praising God, knowing what you did to them. But you got to learn to release that whatever I was is not who I am. I've learned to let it go, and I've learned to let you go too. That it's two sides to the story. Two sides to the story. And none of us, none of us are all good. None of us, none of us are all good, even me included. That's why we like having real church because ain't none of us all good. If you living in this flesh, you need grace too. You need forgiveness too. You need to repent too. You need Jesus too. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit too. Ain't nobody all good. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, even you. None of us are all good. And if none of us are all good, that means you are one mistake away from being the villain in somebody's story. You're one bad day away from being the villain in somebody's story. You are only good to those who have experienced you as such. You are only good to those who have experienced you as such. You can't marry the idea, I know I'm a good person. No, ask people, who do you say I am? Who do you... Say, I am. Jesus walked his disciples right into the trap called a question. He said, when y'all going out into the marketplace, what are people saying about me? Everybody has something to say. Well, they said this, and this one said that, and one said you're Ezekiel, one said you're Jeremiah. He said, oh, really? They said all of that when y'all around? And what do y'all say? Y'all was in the conversation? Knowing who I am, and y'all sat right there and didn't say nothing. Only one person had to come. Only Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But Peter had experienced him as the Christ. He saw him as a glorified Jesus. And you are only good to those who have experienced you. Let me tell you this. There are, there are not as many people defending your character as you think. You assume that people believe that you're good. But the reality of human nature is we all look at one another saying, I don't know about them. They don't want to say amen now. 
Some come out bad about somebody right away. You know what? My spirit always felt that. I always knew something wasn't right. Because we know that there's always two sides to every story. In verse 19, again, it says, they kept telling me about Tobias' good deeds. And so they told them everything that I said. They're going back and forth playing uh, you know, double agent. They coming to me talking about his side, but then going to him talking about my side. And he said, and Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. Now, pay attention to what's happening here. Uh, Tobiah is the entire time constantly sending threatening letters while doing good works for other people threatening this man constantly sending threatening letters to Nehemiah. Even though Tobiah was successful, he still felt threatened by Nehemiah's success. Tobiah was a successful man, but he felt threatened because Nehemiah is coming up with success and he's trying to intimidate Nehemiah. And this kind of behavior comes from a place of jealousy and selfish ambition. Now, I need you to understand this, that there are, there are people who will have more than you and still be intimidated by what God put on you. Okay, you probably missed it. Okay. You don't even have nothing yet. Oh, all you got is a prophecy and a dream. Oh, all you got is that God showed me that one day he going to use me to set the captives free. And even though you don't have anything physically, your anointing is visible and tangible. And so they can have success but be intimidated by what they see in the spirit on you. We see this in the story of Saul and David. All David did was fight one battle and the people started screaming his praise. And even though Saul was the king, he became intimidated by young David because he saw there was an anointing on David. And I need you to know that sometimes the gatekeepers are only trying to keep you out because they know if you get up in here, you got more than what I got on me. You got a greater anointing than what I got. God put more on you than what he's put on me. What if I told you some of the gatekeepers are actually secretly afraid? They're secretly afraid knowing that if you step fully into what God has for you, that you would be a beast in the calling God has on your life. It, it comes from selfish ambition. Now, I got just a few moments. Please let me uh, push my case these last few minutes. In James 3 and 14, James 3 and 14, because I want to talk about what happens when this person or us as people allow jealousy and selfish ambition to come in, even if you are anointed. And please hear me, you can be anointed and still be jealous. Because whenever you hear somebody else getting more praise than you got, whenever you hear some, see somebody else being used more than you're being used, whenever somebody else is getting more hand claps than you've received, whenever they get more likes and reposts and retweets than you got, if you're not careful, you will allow this need to want to be seen to make you envious of the one that God is elevating. And it comes from a place of, watch this, because you're selfish. Let's go to the Bible, James 3 and 14. I'm only, I'm only reading the Bible you read to, James 3 and 14. It says, but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart. Now, I need you to understand this because a lot of times you can't see the jealousness and the selfishness from the outside. That thing hides deep in the heart. They can be right there next to you and selfish. Right there next to you and jealous. Because it's never exposed on the outside. That thing knows how to hide deep on the inside. It says that if it's in your heart, don't cover it up or cover up the truth with boasting and lying. Now, this is a, a, a very big part I need you to catch, all right? Because when somebody is jealous and selfish, the Bible actually exposes to us that many insecure people try to use bragging about their accomplishments to cover up jealousy. Yeah. Right. That, that what they'll try to do is the moment God starts to elevate you, they'll start throwing out their accomplishments of what... 
I done served in ministry. Many, I done got, I know what I'm doing. I, I walk with, you're like, well, I never said that you did. All I said is that God is using me right now. I'm not coming against any way that God has used you. I'm brand new at this thing. I'm just happy that God saw me fit to even use me. They'll use bragging to cover up their jealousy. And if there's two sides to the story, that means that sometimes people are successful and still jealous because they want to be the only one in the story. That people are successful and still jealous because they don't want to share the glory. And I need you to hear me. It's one of the reasons why I love elevating other people because I need need us to know that the moment you start getting stingy with the glory, you are moving into the devil's territory. Please stick with me. I promise you, I'm prophesying this. You're moving into demonic territory. I'll give you scripture because you don't believe me anyways. Here we go. James 3 and 15. It says, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Thank you for the 15% claps on the left side of the building. Here with me. It says that jealousy and selfishness are earthly. They're unspiritual, which means you cannot say you're following the Holy Spirit and you're jealous. You cannot say you're following the Holy Spirit and you're selfish. It says, as a matter of fact, let's not, let's not just say that it's not God, because we can say it's not God, but it's still us. No, he said, it's not even you. You are actually operating in the demonic. The moment you get selfish, you are operating in the demonic. And verse 16 closes it out by saying, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. I'm going to preach this, all right? Wherever there's jealousy and selfish ambition, you will always find disorder and evil of every kind. Now watch this. You have to be careful to make sure that you're not so stuck on your calling that you start causing disorder. I'm going to help you out. It's okay. Because if selfishness is demonic, you got to ask yourself, are there times where the enemy is using me because all I was thinking about was myself? Two sides to the story. Uh, they, no, but I was the one hurting the story. They, they did this to me. If all you're thinking about is yourself, you're actually operating what's called selfishness. And the moment you start operating in selfishness, the enemy is like, perfect, I got you, because that is where I paralyze your authority. Now, I can go through all scripture to prove this point. We see this thing also in the story of Job, where the Bible says as long as Job thought about himself, he stayed sick, he stayed broke, he stayed in poverty, and God would not turn this situation. And it was not until that Job prayed for his friends. The Bible says that when he finally got his eyes off himself, that God started to turn his situation. And maybe things haven't turned around for you because God knows all you're thinking about is yourself. Your calling, your purpose, your money, your family, what you want me to do. But God is saying, no, when you get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on the kingdom, then I can finally put some stuff in your hands. I can finally trust you when your eyes come off of yourself. Sometimes we're so focused on ourselves that we didn't recognize we became demonic. God had to show me this, that many of us right now, we we don't know this. We can think that we're building the kingdom, and what we're actually doing is building our own castle in his kingdom. Because any time we go to my ministry and my calling and what God told me to do and what I must do, the moment you get start talking about yourself, you forget that Jesus actually was the one that paid the price and that he was the one that gave the call and that you would be nothing had Jesus not put something on your life. Please don't get it twisted. You ain't that important. That even me, I'm nothing without his hand literally carrying me into what he's called me to do. 
And, and maybe, just challenge, I promise I'm done. Maybe this year, because you say, man, can I take some of the blame? Because the people who hurt me, they probably really did. But man, I probably hurt some people too. And maybe, maybe I can forgive a little bit easier. If I can just remember, God, I needed you to forgive me for the people that I hurt. And I can't ask you to punish them, but give me grace. I can't say, God, get them, but don't get me. No, I got to ask. If I'm asking for grace for me, God, I'm praying for grace for them. If I'm asking for mercy for me, God, I'm giving mercy to them. If I'm asking for a second chance for me, then God, give a second chance to them. Let me pray this prayer. God, we know that there are two sides to the story. My prayer today, God, is that we won't get so stuck in selfishness and selfish ambition that we become demonic where the enemy can actually use us for evil because all we think about is ourselves. I pray, God, that as you challenge our perspective today, God, that we, that we will learn to say, Lord, show us ourselves. The old song would say, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. This time I'm not praying about my mom or my dad or my sister or my brother or my enemy or my hater or my opposer. This time I'm talking about myself, that I need to be the one that's better and stop being selfish and so focused on what I want or jealous of other people. Let me be grateful for where you have me today. Let me appreciate what you put in my hands. Let me be grateful for what you've called for me to stay in. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, amen. I want to do two things really quickly. Two, one, if you want to give your life to Jesus, if you never got a chance to say yes to him, or you want to submit your life to Jesus, this is your opportunity, your moment to say yes. You can come forward like, you know what, Pastor? I just want to actually give my life to Jesus and surrender. Number two, if you're looking for a church home and you want this church to be your church home. You can come forward at this time. Ain't gonna make you say nothing. Just wanna get a chance to love on you and welcome you. Anybody looking for a church home and they want this church to be there, just come forward. We're gonna get a chance to hug on you and that's it. I ain't gonna put the microphone to your mouth or nothing. I ain't gonna make you feel weird. Just come on. Hallelujah, welcome. Welcome home, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Welcome home, welcome home, welcome home. Welcome home, welcome home, let's go. Welcome home, welcome home, let's go. Welcome home, welcome home, welcome home, hallelujah. Welcome home, I see you, welcome home. Welcome home, hallelujah. Welcome home, welcome home, hallelujah. Welcome home, welcome home, man. Welcome home, man, hallelujah. Is there anybody else? I want to make sure I don't miss anybody before I come down. God is so good. Hallelujah. Welcome home. Listen, we got Pastor Dugar and Sierra right here. There's a private reception that we have for you in the back. So if you want prayer, if you want to give your life to Christ, if you have any question or just to join the church, whatever you need, Pastor Dugar, Sierra, and the team will take care of you in the back, okay? We got somebody else coming? Come on. I can wait on you. Listen, I ain't in no rush. I ain't in no rush. Anybody else? I ain't in no rush. Come on. So you guys can follow Pastor Dugar back to the private reception and back there, him, Sierra, and the team and take care of you, okay? You can come this way and follow him. Let's count them off, y'all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Last but not least, Jesus said, my father's house is going to be a house of prayer. I don't know what you're dealing with, but what I know is that prayer changes things. If you're in this room and you need prayer, maybe you need prayer for God to clean your perspective. Because God, all I saw was what happened to me. I never saw what I did to them. If that's you, I pray that you would come receive prayer. We got prayer leaders up front. 
trained, prepped, and ready to intercede on your behalf. I know that God will touch you and heal and move in so many ways. Let me release everybody else, but if you want prayer, stay in the worship space. Father, my prayer is that you would do what you always do. During this prayer time, would you heal, restore, deliver, and set free. I pray for those that are traveling home to various destinations or to go get food. I pray for safety over them. I pray that no hurt, harm, or danger will come on anybody here nor anybody connected to them. As their pastor, I'll cover their life. I'll cover their families. I'll cover their kids. I'll cover their marriages. I'll cover their relationships. I'll cover their body. I speak total health right now in the name of Yeshua, I pray. God's people say it. I love you so much.